Welcome to a very special evening celebrating the exhibition We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, 1965 to 1985, with the one and only Southern genius, Alice Walker. <laughs> um, tonight's event and the exhibition are part of the Year of Yes, and I forgot to introduce us. Hi. I'm Katherine Morris, and I'm the Sackler Family Senior Curator of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art here at the Brooklyn Museum. And I am Rujeko Hockley, former assistant curator here at the Brooklyn Museum and current assistant curator at the Whitney Museum, and we are the co-curators of We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women. We are. <laughs> Tonight's event and the exhibition are part of the Year of Yes, a year-long celebration of the 10th anniversary of the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art here at the Brooklyn Museum. We'd like to begin our thanks by giving a very special shout out to our Brooklyn Museum members who are joining us here this evening. Your support, thank you. Your support means so much to us. It helps make programs like this possible. If you're interested in becoming a member and enjoying free tickets to special events such as this one and invitations to members only events, please see a member at the membership desk after this meeting. This is not a meeting after this event. <laughs> We're a little bit nervous. We're a little nervous. <laughs> um, we'd also like to thank the trustee Elizabeth A. Sackler, our board chair Barbara Vogelstein, and Shelby White and Leon Levy director Ann Pasternak, and all the Brooklyn Museum trustees for making tonight possible. Thanks are also due to all the supporters, donors, lenders who made war possible. Many of you are here tonight, and we must acknowledge that this groundbreaking exhibition is what it is, thanks to you. Thanks also to the programs team. There's many of you who have pulled together tonight's wonderful event. Thank you. <laughs> Finally, we would like to thank the more than 40 artists in We Wanted a Revolution. The power of this show is a direct reflection of the power of their belief, beginning more than 50 years ago, that a revolutionary future was possible, a future guided by individual rights, free from the political, cultural, and social oppressions enacted on human beings because of their race, their gender, their socioeconomic status, their sexual orientation, or any, other dis or any disability. It has been an honor to work together to make, with them to make this exhibition possible. So thank you to the artists. Um, to have Alice Walker here in the context of this exhibition um, is nothing short of an actual dream come true and an incredible honor, as I'm sure you all can assume and can tell. She was incredibly important to the way we conceived of this exhibition and to the way in which it has come together, both in the galleries and in the accompanying publication. Um, like many of you, I'm sure she has been a touchstone and an inspiration, um, someone you've returned to time and time again, whether her novels, her short stories, her poems, her work as an activist. Um, like many of you also, especially those of you who are perhaps closer to my age, you might have been introduced to Ms. Walker first by your mother, as I was. Um, she brought me to a reading in Washington, D.C. when I was three years old to meet Alice Walker because she was part of her personal pantheon of greats. Um, and I think that that lineage, that connection, um, the fact that my mom said nothing as all her Alice Walker books disappeared out the door of her house um, as I grew up and left home, that this is a critical inheritance that we have, that I have personally, but I'm sure many of you also have from our mothers, but also from Miss Walker and from the people and places and times that she connects us to. So. Zora Neale Hurston, whose work she brought back into popular consciousness after years of obscurity to now be someone that we all read. Yeah. Um, someone that we read in you know, middle school and high school curriculum all over the country and world. Um, somebody who brought a term to us that we needed, womanism. Yes. term to describe the different ways that black women thought of and engaged with feminism. As she says, womanist is to feminist as purple is to lavender. 
and so, so, so much more. Um, so I just want to say how grateful we are um, that you are here and that Ms. Walker is here and that we can have this moment of exchange, inheritance, generational continuity that's so central to our lives, but also to the exhibition and to this evening. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for that very warm welcome. I'm very happy to be here with you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what revolution is. Uh, you know, what is it? And how do we get to it? Uh, in my own life, what I've discovered is that it is mostly about the revolution that occurs within us. You need the mic. <laughs> Um, that revolution is often projected as something that is uh, outside of us and in many cases beyond us. Um, but in my life, what I have discovered is that revolution has to be from within. Uh, unless we change ourselves, there is no change. And the people who try to change society without changing themselves fail. I've just been reading um, Alexandra Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, and I recommend it to all of us to read because it's a wonderful way to, I mean, wonderful in a sort of a horrific way. Uh, it's a great way for us to understand how revolution that sounds, um, you know, like it's magically somehow going to change the world without the people themselves doing the work of interchange is, is a failure, it will fail. So we don't want to be uh, caught in any glamorization of re revolution, you know. But we do want to pay homage to people who see the need for the change and go after it, both outside themselves and inside. But I do insist uh, from my own life uh, and from what I've seen over the years of living this life that uh, you get very um, little traction and you get a very short distance if you don't change yourself as you're trying to change the world. So um, it's wonderful for me to be here and to be a part of this, um, the, the exploration and the exposure of this exhibit because these are women who understood that they had a duty to make art out of the lives of the people around them uh, and to show the, the depth of their own compassion uh, and some, in some cases their own pain uh, I think that as we go on in this world, uh, to the extent that we are going to go on in it, we will see much more joy in our art. And this is a great desire on my part and my hope that we will come to that place in our art um, where we understand that joy is a revolutionary um, feeling and a revolutionary desire and a revolutionary way of being. Uh, we have a long way to go. Uh, but it doesn't mean we won't get to, to that place, you know. And I, I think from my own upbringing in the South, which is very different from many of the women and the artists in this exhibit, I grew up uh, in very difficult circumstances, but I was surrounded from birth by nature. So to me, there, there is a real necessity in, in the creativity of the present and the future for us to include trees and the sky and the sun uh, and all of the elements of nature as part of what it is that makes us truly human. Um, and so, you know, I myself paint um, and I find myself drawn to images of, of, you know, things that I knew as a child, um, flowers and trees and birds and, um, you know, just the, the undulations of the countryside. Uh, the magic of the fields that stretched forever. Now it took a great deal of work to work those fields, but in essence they were extraordinarily beautiful. 
and in their own way, very calming uh, as an art to the spirit. Um, so I want to start out by reading a few things. What I've decided is that in this phase of my life, I want to do what I've started out wanting to do and what I think my parents thought I would be doing with my life. I wanted to be a teacher. Um, and I, you know, wandered off in that area uh, a few times and it was not a good area to uh, work in as I was also trying to write novels. It just wasn't. Motherhood was also a challenge. And those of you who have children understand that, you know, it's a, it's a difficult path to be deeply creative and, and uh, in the sense that you feel called by your ancestors to do this work. It's these women, these women in this exhibit, obviously, uh, have felt that call that connects, you know, the, the old revolutionaries, the ones who, you know, were, were legendary when, when we were coming along to the present that they experienced uh, in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Um, so one of the ways to, um, to help us um, be revolutionary uh, is to be determined to at least, uh, to the extent that we can do it, control our own mind. Uh, without a sense of your own mind and what it is capable of doing and what it is, uh, it is really a challenge to change a society. Uh, that's because your mind uh, is, is constantly being colonized. Uh, and we are we're really aware of this. I mean, we are aware that um, you know, it's going to get worse with artificial intelligence. I mean, you know, how about just some intelligence? Um, <laughs> not to move on to the artificial kind before we're ready, you know. Um, but anyway, that is an indicator of, of where we have been and where we are. I mean, we are as human beings on this planet, you know, not really knowing how we got here. You know, we don't. We don't really know that. Uh, we are at the mercy of beings, or whoever they are, who do know how to train us uh, in ways that are detrimental to our growth. And this is really, really uh, not good for us because we risk actually losing what humanity that we still have and is dribbling away as we watch, you know, our money being used to kill people that we would really like if we could, you know, see them and sit with them and, you know, visit them and, you know, see their children and talk about mundane things like weather and, you know, cooking and gardens and clothing and, you know, I mean, just regular people. So we're being done in, uh, in on many levels, and awareness of this uh, is part of our uh, possibility of freedom. We, we may be able to escape to some, some degree if we are aware of how we're being stolen from ourselves. We are being stolen from ourselves. So the revolution uh, that we really most need is the one in which we lay claim uh, to who we actually are, you know, that we are beings who are very special, even if we don't know how we got here or what we are. You know, most of us don't. We have an ideology, we have a religion, we have what our parents told us, but really, when you're sitting there, I'm sure many of you in this audience meditate, but when you're sitting there on that cushion, it's just you and your mind, um, and then there's you and space, can you actually say that you know you know, who you are, what you are, how you got here. Um, and it's worth, you know, pondering these things so that you don't continue and we don't continue being led down a path that uh, is inimical to, you know, what we would most like to, to do, which is to cherish this planet and all the beings on this planet that are so incredibly precious. You know, I have on my uh, iPhone, which I just got and which I'm sure is perilous, but I got it. And what wakes me up in the morning is the sound of bird song, which you can get on your iPhone as something that wakes you up. <laughs> and I love this, but I, I lie there and I think, well, you know, the birds, uh, unless we really wake up so strongly, will be just a recording. And we won't even be able to tell our children how they flew. 
you know, children, you'll be trying to say, oh, well, they flew this way and they flew that way, and all they will be able to imagine is a bird like an airplane, you know, or something that's mechanical. Um, so anyway, this uh, uh, first piece that I'm going to read to you, part of what I want to do in my, my role now is, is teaching when I, where I go, um, is to share with, with everyone uh, that I'm talking to um, what I'm doing recently. I mean, I, I, um, you know, I have never stopped writing, not for, I don't think, a second. Uh, and so there is always something new, and I thought I would start to share that uh, it's on my, my website, my blog, but I would also read it to you, and then um, we can go on from there and you know talk about whatever comes up uh, out of these 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 places uh, that I've been visiting, mentally and physically and spiritually recently. And as all of you know, and all of us know, we are in a perilous situation on the planet. Um, you, you know, it's. Um, you can't even talk about leadership, you know. I mean, unless you lead yourself, you, you're pretty done for, you know. And that is part of why the mind is so important. So this is what to do with the mind. Um, I have not been this depressed. And this, this is, you know, this is acknowledging uh, where many of us have been and where some of us still are. But truthfully, over the last six months or so, we, we have collectively... Um, been depressed, and it has been such a joy that so many of us have also risen above the depression to stand with each other, because that is our hope. Our hope for any kind of future is that we stand together and we express ourselves, um, even knowing that uh, that is, is possibly really dangerous for us. I have not been this depressed since President John Kennedy was assassinated. I was a student at Spelman when this happened. No, I have not been this depressed since Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. I was in Mississippi working in the civil rights movement when that happened. No, I haven't been this depressed since Malcolm X was assassinated. No, I haven't been this depressed since Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. No, I haven't been this depressed since I realized that when they assassinated Che Guevara, they cut off his hands, and he was a doctor. How long is this list? And reading it, so many other names might be added. All of you, I'm sure, if you don't know the names yourselves, your parents do. And reading it, so many other names might be added. So many disasters too, crimes against people and earth, so heinous they are unfathomable to the average mind. So much of what is happening. Really, it is unfathomable to your mind. If you have an ordinary mind, like you know, all of us, I mean, the things that people are doing to each other, the things that they are doing, especially the children, you, you just, uh, it, it's unbelievable. So what to do with the mind that is overwhelmed by grief and disbelief, which is where most of us are, really. You know, I mean, we may be carrying on, and we do be beautifully, really, because we, we, you know, we, we are humans, and we, that's part of what we, we have, the capacity to carry on. But really, we are, we're pretty bewildered by the, what's happening. <clears throat> While writing my early novels <clears throat> and raising my daughter, and after a truly heartbreaking divorce, I discovered meditation. It not only saved my sanity, such as it was at the time, it saved my life. I meditated regularly for years. Then my practice of formal sitting fell into disuse, became spotty, an afterthought. In fact, I used to think I'd meditated so much already I didn't need to keep it up. What a mistake that was. Which is to say, <clears throat> through this present period of basic cruelty and relentless suffering, basic cruelty, basic cruelty, and relentless, relentless suffering, I have had to reach back to bring my practice of meditation forward. And I have the Dalai Lama to thank for reminding me how precious it is. I was given his little book of inner peace by someone who loves me, someone who saw I was suffering, as we all might, from a period of serious global disenchantment brought on by human malevolence and greed. But what I got from reading the book was something I had not expected a casual revelation of how many times a day the Dalai Lama meditates. 
five or six times. I had thought 20 minutes twice a day was sufficient in the early years because that was what I could squeeze for myself between raising a child and making a living. Then when I had more time, I meditated for half an hour to an hour twice a day, but five or six times, no. I never dreamed we could meditate so many times. Though it is said of Milarepa, a Buddhist yogi, that he meditated for so long, he almost turned into a plant. I have returned to my practice, and though I am not yet meditating as frequently as His Holiness does, I have thrown away my clock, one of the perks of being old enough not to care much about time. After all, it is one thing that will probably always be there wherever you have gone. And I'm writing this now because I think it might be helpful medicina for you, especially those of you who will be freed as I have been into a wider and deeper understanding of how to rediscover the clear sky, the clear sky that is our mind when we have learned to outsit the mental clouds. Imagine the mental clouds His Holiness has outsat. I have found sitting as often and for as long as I can, coupled with learning the news from comedians Trevor Noah, Samantha B., Seth Myers, and others, to be a reliable support for these times. <laughs> the historical pattern in situations similar to ours, when the people are in depression as we are, fear as we are, and despair as we are, is for the oppressors to drug them into submission, knowing they are desperate to endure no more pain. This has happened in many other countries, like China, for instance, and it has happened and is happening here. It is essential to learn ways to protect the mind. Increasing one's frequency and length of meditation and learning bad news first from comedians could be one of them. So yes, by all means, protect the mind. I was speaking with a sister recently, just a, actually a few, half an hour, an hour ago, about you know, some of the lyrics and some of the music that we are assaulted by. I mean, we are assaulted. You know, the things that are said about our bodies, the things, the things that are implied about our minds, um, we, we are being battered into a kind of um, sodden mass of misery, and often by young people that we love you know, or even not young people that we love and we try to protect and care for. Because on that line of uh, development, you know, in consciousness, we have been derailed. I mean, the, the, for the most part, the, the people who, who suffer from some of the lyrics of some of the music are people who tried very hard to have a revolution, who have tried to change society. Uh, and we have found that so much of it has not only not changed, but it has regressed and it has become more vicious and it is actually lethal to us. And these are, th this is one of the areas where we can circle and, and, um, and together find a way uh, to liberate ourselves from this because otherwise we're just being damaged daily. I mean, we are being harmed. This is, har this is real harm to us. Uh, the psyche is not meant to be abused in this way. The body is not meant to be abused in this way. You know, the, the female body is a holy, um, a holy, mm, beautiful, be, uh, what would you call it? Just goddess. <laughs> and it should be revered and it should be respected, you know, uh, and to hear the ways in which it is being degraded uh, is, is almost unacceptable, and it is unacceptable, and it's almost unbelievable, given where we came from in trying to have a revolution in which we would actually see the fullness of our, our goddess self and the beauty of ourselves as people of color, for instance, and intelligent beings of whatever um, color and kind. So <clears throat> this um, next piece that I want to read to you is, let's see, what is it? Um, <clears throat> well, I think, I, I think there's some 
words that we actually need to do more intensive study of in order to free ourselves from uh, the ways in which they hurt us. And nigger is one of them. So this next poem is called Nigger in the Language of Love. Because we need help here. And, you know, there are those of us um, who just can't bear the word at all. Um, there are those of us who, who use it because, you know, our parents use it and the people on the street use it and all of that. But I think what is missing is that real understanding of its original function uh, and the way that it was used and has been used and can be used uh, in a very different way than the way that it is used that wounds us. So this is called um, Nigger in the Language of Love and it's turning a poison into medicine. Uh, and I have Buddhism to thank for this, this idea of, of how you can use um, things in, a, in such a different way that they can actually help in your healing rather than in your destruction. And I dedicate this for all those who remind us of how this works. For instance, in Fences, I don't know if you saw that, uh, the movie that was made of August Wilson's play that uh, Denzel Washington directed, but it is, you know, there's a whole uh, part of it that was um, very striking to me in the use between the people and among the people of the word nigger. And it reminded me of how I grew up in the South um, where people use this term and they used it in a different way than what other people often use it uh, in. So pretty soon we might all be niggers. A just karma, a just karma is beginning to snow down upon us. Maybe you will be happier then to find you can indeed live on your knees and sometimes create a tune or fashion a breakdance there. Among our people during enslavement and segregation, known otherwise as the extended period of identity eradication, the extended period of identity eradication lasted a long time, Nigger became a bonding word, a word of self-defense, a claim of solidarity. It could signify intimacy, brother or sisterhood, a playful or anguished invitation to acknowledge shared abuse, a stubborn standing. It also meant after ages, after ages of fighting among ourselves, and destroying each other's clans in tribal warfare in Africa, we discovered, holy shit, we are one. Among our scholars, it signified aeons of village life along the Niger River, and our captors' lack of facility with accents unlike their own, then as now. Nun niggers have always been a frightful visitation, invading lands and bodies while calling it discovery, raping women and children, cutting infants in half when not feeding them to their dogs, smashing worlds, murdering anything alive for the fun of it, caring for nothing they could not gobble up, ravish, or sell. Some of us, badly raised, call them pigs, or more genteelly, trash. Not human, as niggers understand the term yet. Imagine, we niggers fell in love with the very ground we were enslaved to destroy. We noticed its fecundity, yes, but also its magical faithfulness. Didn't we realize it would never belong to us? We protected the slave master's offspring as though they were our own. What to do with such backwardness? None niggers made us sing because they did not know how or were afraid to fully open spirits or mouths. None niggers made us dance because they were as if born that way, ashamed to freely move. 
It was niggers who taught them to boogie. They burned our drums. They burned our drums. We drummed our bodies. We endured a level of life none niggers denied themselves. And now we see how disconnected from nature and even feeling is the ruling caste. How it has always been, though it pretends these days so traumatic for everyone to care about both. To gobble up the world and lose everything just the same. To die in the misery of global suicide. When you might have lived happily and long as a nigger yourself. Praising life, enduring meanness and stupidity, but boogieing on through the misery. What a different world we'd have if you had learned to prevent, notice, or share our suffering, rather than ignore, ridicule, or profit from it. To grasp and hold as precious, as precious, the deep lessons of soul and liveliness. You were carefully and through so much pain, nigger by nigger, being taught. How did you feel about that? We can't run away from words that hurt. We have to figure out what they're really saying, what they really mean, and who we are in relation to them. And also who the people are who are using them to abuse us. You know, these things we have to interrogate, we have to know. Because you can be kept enslaved by what someone calls you. And they don't know any more about what they're calling you than you do. You know, all of this stuff has a history. It has a history. It has a meaning, it has a reality. So, uh, the, the next one I just wrote, I think two days ago, maybe three days ago, <clears throat> because I really was so happy to learn that uh, Sweden had dropped the charges against Julian Assange. Uh, he was charged with raping someone who uh, later confessed that the police told her to say that. Um, and I think that what he does for the, for, for the world is so important uh, in sharing WikiLeaks with us uh, and with you know everybody on the planet, basically, so that we're no longer quite so far in the dark. Do you realize how, you know, compared to uh, what is out there for us to know, how little of it we know? I mean, in order to make decisions about how we live and how we want our children to grow up, we know so little. And it's been so deliberately kept from us. And so unless we have people who are strong enough to share um, what they, you know, dig out of the, the vaults, uh, it's very possible that we cannot make good choices about anything. You know, not about seeds, not about food, you know, not about uh, Monsanto, not about, you know, you, you name it. You know, not about these politicians who pretend to be um, working for us, and obviously they're not, you know. Uh, so anyway, um, this is called Acts of Truth. And I, I like this. Do you know Michael Mead, the mythologist? I hope, I hope you learn him if you don't know him already, because um, his way of looking at the world through myth gives us incredible grounding in our understanding of present events. Uh, and it helps us to realize that all the stuff that we see, all of these behaviors, you know, for example, in your maximum leader, that behavior that he's demonstrating um, is the behavior that in myth has existed forever. 
you know, that extreme narcissism, that, you know, the ignorance, the, you know, the inability to feel for other people. Um, so, so there's a model in myth for all of these, uh, you know, these beings who seem so puzzling to us. And, and, and they, you know, they are scary and they are, you know, um, we will we are it's good for us to to have some you know fear uh and not just be you know acting as if they can't do great harm because obviously they they do uh great harm every day anyhow acts of truth for julian assange inspired by mythologist michael mead michael was telling us the other night about some things that might save the world one of them surprised me but the more i thought about it the more it made sense the whole world can be saved, and if not the whole world, then the world of our relationships, which is, you know, the world, by committing simple acts of truth. In the story Michael tells, a dying child cannot live if his parents cannot find courage enough to commit an act of truth. So the father, after much blather, admits he is and has been a fraud in practically everything he's done. The mother says she never loved him, even in the fake throes, the fake throes of passionate love. Even the monk who is called on to help these hapless liars admits he has no real idea of the right path or the honest way. He only took holy vows because a person taking holy vows is admired. At each act of truth, each utterance of what is true, the dying child revives little by little until he is whole enough to skip away. That child is our ailing world, our human universe, lying, dying right at death's door. And each of us, each of us, lying about everything imaginable, including hair color, and concern about polluting the water, fur coats and love of animals, that caps up on our diamonds, the bombings and oil thirst must now decide. Do we want our child, this world, to live, or must it die? Can we commit an act of truth that begins to set it skipping once more on healthy feet? Because I've known humans at their best, I know we are capable, maybe not all of us, but enough to commit daily radical acts of truth. There is even a collective one. We can cease to lie to confuse the neighbors, whether next door or in countries we've never seen. We can be deeper, more courageous, indeed more fearless, and much simpler than we know. Standing in our acts of truth, our words of truth, as others, like small children, watching a fascinating and very unusual game, skip to join us. How are you doing? Now this last one uh, I wrote just after the, um, the Women's March, which I just loved. I, I thought, um, <laughs> and I loved all the people who joined, you know, all the, the men, the children, everybody. It was just such a, such a healing uh, time uh, and expression of how we are not done in yet you know, they'll have a ways to go to really do us in. And we needed that, we needed to show that. Um, so my sense of how things are on this planet is that we transition from it uh, and we become part of what is my sense of what God is, this essential awareness, this great, you know, this great awareness of, of life, of being. Um, and that is what this prayer is, a prayer to the great awareness, and it's dedicated to the awakening. I do not doubt that you are there and that I am also, 
in some future past time, and that together we are enjoying it all. And so I thank you, great awareness, in which I also live, for calla lilies and birds and hollyhocks and bougainvillea and the aroma of a good pozole and the fit of a new dress. There are then the stars that I love and the rivers I adore and the single leaves of trees in which I can lose my temporary this moment self in the sheer wonder of it all. And women marching everywhere and being the most wondrous of the human lot with their amazing capacity to recreate the human universe. Oh, great and everlasting awareness, I have been with you while looking for you all my long life, and here you turn up today, as you do every day, as myself, as all the awakened women, children, and men in the world, and everything else. So the other part of my teaching has to do with my belief that it is better to just have people ask direct questions. And out of my experience, if I have any medicine, I'm happy to offer it, uh, especially if I can remember it. <laughs> so I think I'm sitting now with someone and two people. And if you, if you have any, anything that you would like to ask, um, I will do my best uh, to offer what I have. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. So we're just really quickly, what we're gonna see, because I see there's a person ready to ask a question. So we're gonna talk a little bit and then we're gonna open it up. And when you ask your questions, you do need to go to the microphones. And we thought we might um, start, and I do have a question. Um, but by invoking Beverly Buchanan, a wonderful artist in our current exhibition, a friend of yours, a beautiful poem in our source book. There's a, a, just a brief passage. I can't believe I'm about to read your words to you. But I'd love to read my words. <laughs> you want to? Yes. Sure. Yeah, I love Beverly. <laughs> Much better. Thank God. <laughs> so this is the, How do we make new and restorative a soul the old pain? Now there's a, there's a question for you, <laughs> really, you know, but you have to. How do we make new and restorative of soul the old pain? How do we learn to carry with grace and humor all that has happened to us? Really? It's doable. I mean, that's what you have to remember. There will always be a Beverly Buchanan arising from a virtual, quote, nowhere to cobble together the broken pieces left over from the beauty that is destroyed and paint them red, paint them red for dancing. Thank you for that. So my personal truth question you mentioned our fear and despair and depression, but one thing I noticed you didn't mention was our anger. And I'm wondering what you think and are feeling about the anger that I think a lot of us are also feeling at the current moment. Uh, well, I feel that you must sit long enough to understand that you don't want your anger to get you into trouble. I, I have a very practical uh, place in my thinking about anger. Uh, I affirm it because, of course, it's natural, and we should feel it, and it, we do feel it, and, you know. However, what I've noticed in many neighborhoods and in many cultures, uh, if there is not sufficient preparation and thought, uh, our anger leads us into such danger uh, that we are undermined, not just personally, but the entire community. So it, it is something to be handled really, really gently and carefully. 
but never, but we should never say to people that they mustn't have it. It's, it's a right, you have a right to be angry. Uh, and it's actually a good force because it, is, it has a cleansing quality to it. I mean, you know yourself, uh, I, hope, I hope you do, that to be really cleanly, fiercely angry uh, is very good for the spirit because it gives it a little jolt. You know, it, it says, wake up, you know, you've been insulted. Uh, and you are, in, in uh, the, you know, the, the words of my upbringing in the church, you are a child of God, and this must never be permitted to happen to you. So be fiercely angry. However, the other part, as I've just mentioned, says uh, you must have caution and you must use really good common sense because actually you are needed, you know, even the anger. Uh, we can use it in painting, we can use it in demonstrations, we can use it in dance, we can use it in building. It's a force that can be harnessed and used for something that we need. And we dare not just throw it away just because we feel like it. It's too precious. Anger is precious. I love whoever's doing that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, in actually keeping with thinking about kind of the uses of anger, which is also an incredible a title of an Audre Lorde essay that was also so important to us in putting this exhibition together, we are wondering if you could talk to us a little bit about feminism in your life, how you came to identify or disidentify, and maybe even your experiences at Ms. Magazine, and then to womanism. Give me a direct question. <laughs> what was it like to work at Ms. Magazine, <laughs> and why did you leave? Oh, why did I leave? <laughs> okay. That, that's, that's I'm trying to leave it open. But. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Um, well, let me put it this way. I was living in Mississippi. Uh, Martin Luther King had just been assassinated. I had just had a miscarriage. I was very low. Um, Gloria Steinem came to Mississippi and asked me if I would come and work at Ms. Magazine because I had been sending my stories to North not going north myself because Martin Luther King told us to stay in the south, so I was there. But it was very, it was very challenging. Uh, so, and interestingly, I don't have a memory of her actually doing this in Mississippi because I was totally grief stricken. I mean, I was, I was under the, I was under the sod uh, with grief. Um, but eventually, uh, Mississippi, after 10 years, had really gotten to both me and my husband and my my child, although I don't think she remembers much of it. And we decided to leave, and so I went to, to, to accept this position at Ms. Magazine. Uh, it was really important to do that because I wanted uh, to expose the, especially the African women writers that I had discovered while I lived in Mississippi. Um, and also Zora, I had discovered in a big way in Mississippi. Uh, and we needed a place to publish uh, these African women writers and, and other, you know, women writers, uh, and also to 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 have a, a place where Zora, when she was resurrected, could actually be noticed. You know, you, you, there were very there were no other places really for for that to happen. Um, I went to Essence, for instance, with some of my work at some point, uh, and they were offended by what they call the dialect of people. Uh, because they said black people didn't speak that way. Well, my mother spoke that way, so what was I supposed to think? You know, I got myself out of there. Uh, so it was a challenge, though, because I understood that my womanism, which was uh, absolutely crucial to the black community, which is that you do not, I mean, you, you struggle with black men, but you understand that you are in a situation together and that you have to, you have to work it through. Now, many black men never understood that about my work. They never understood womanism, but it doesn't matter. You know, I understand what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so, so to be short, make this a little shorter, it was okay to work there as long as I could also have a room of my own there. Uh, because I accepted the reality that I was very different. You know, I was very different from most of the women who were white, uh, who were middle class, uh, and who had a incredibly, you know, so many more opportunities 
um, than I had. Uh, so I, you know, I, I knew the work that I needed to do. I wanted to really explore and expose these African writers. Uh, I wanted to write myself about you know, the women that I was experiencing uh, in Mississippi and Georgia. I wanted to write about my mother. Uh, and I wanted to write among people who, even when they didn't understand what I was doing all the time, they respected that it was a passion uh, that I, as a woman, you know, embodied and that it had to be done as far as I was concerned, you know. So there was respect. Uh, and that was not to be had anywhere else at the time. Thank you. We're going to jump around a little bit here. Mm. Um, one of the most um, rewarding parts of the exhibition, We Wanted a Revolution for Me, has been to see the, um, the driver for a lot of the enthusiasm and the support and the belief in this exhibition has been by young women through social media. And um, that, for me, has been a remarkably rewarding experience to see young women pushing a dialogue about the need for this exhibition in their lives and in their friends' lives and in their families' lives. And um, you spoke about your blog. And um, so, and you have obviously lived through this sort of emergence of this new way of communicating um, and um, reaching people. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. I know you founded um, Wild Tree Press in 1983, mm -hmm. obviously, so you were, I imagine, already thinking about wanting to get your own voice out in your own way. Um, I didn't publish myself. I published other people. And I did that because at the time I was being trounced by, you know, everybody and everybody's brother and some of the mothers too, about the color purple. Uh, and, and I just repaired myself to the countryside and founded a press. And I decided to publish other people who were, well, they, none of them were as unpopular at the time as I felt I was, but, you know, they didn't have a large following. Um, so that was, uh, the model there, I think, was the Hogarth Press, um, Virginia Woolf's Press, and I figured if Virginia could do it, I could do it. And so I had bought, I bought 40 acres of land in Mendocino, um, and I would have bought a mule. <laughs> but... <laughs> you can still buy a mule. No, 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 darling, I, I got a rototiller. Um, <laughs> I, but anyway, so, so I, I bought this land, and, and there are all these little shacks on it, and I just renovated one of those little shacks into a publishing company and settled in there in the country, and while people were raging about, you know, how I was destroying whatever and blah, 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 I was publishing, and I was very happy. Yeah. What was the other part of your question? <laughs> Your blog. It was a two-part question. Um, no, the other part was about now how you how you use your blog and how you use um, the internet to, to sort of get your voice out in a different kind of way. Well, I like it very much, uh, you, know, you know, the blog, my blog, because I'm an Aquarian. And people, how many Aquarians are in here? Yeah, good. <laughs> well, you know, the thing about us uh, <laughs> is that we live a lot in the air. And, and it's a very natural highway, you know, for, for us. We think, we think like that. And so to me, it's almost as if I was waiting for this uh, means of communication to happen so that I could, could uh, extend my work in the way that feels most natural to me, which is just to put it out there. Uh, because you know, well, you may not know, but when you write a book, sometimes it takes at least a year. So by the time the book comes out, you know, you, you don't feel very connected to it, and, but then you have to go and do all the things you have to do to promote it. Whereas if you just write it on your blog, you put it out there, and, you know, you don't care where it lands. If it lands, you know, it's just your contribution to, you know, the whole thing. Uh, there's a wonderful feeling of, of connectivity and also liberation, and just, I, I just love it. Mm -hmm. Do you have interactivity with, with your readers through your blog? I don't let them do that. <laughs> that is a totally understandable and, and, stance and I, to take. Yeah, and I, I actually counsel young people not to let people just have a thought about 
what you should be writing instead or how you should be doing it instead. You'll do that yourself. I mean, you, can, you come to your own editorship um, and it's, and it's uh, something that is organic and it's, it's good for you. I mean, it's good for you to in the, the stillness of your room and your heart and your wherever you are, uh, to decide and, and to come to know what is the exact right word, what is the exact right phrase, what is the exact, exact next step. You know, these um, people who come on to tell you, you know, how something you've written or something you said is wrong or should be done a different way, what do they know about you? Really, I mean, how, what do they know about your study of, of, you know, of life and the essence of, of creativity and reality? Very little. And then they so often misspell. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so basically, I would say they're just bad for you. <laughs> and you should just click off that part. And, and I did that. I never have had it underneath, you know, where people can say stuff. Now there's a there's a, a blog thing that my my one of my publishers uses and, and they they have that function where people write the, and they write really nice things and I'm sometimes really happy to read them but I can't be controlled by what other people think about what I'm doing. Does this mean we shouldn't look for you on Facebook? Um, I have a hard time with Facebook although my friend Valerie who's out there who's been trying to bring me along. <laughs> Uh, and sometimes I love it because they're, they're pieces you would never see anywhere else. I mean, wonderful things. And I love the animal parts, you know. <laughs> like there's a, there's a little, there's, no really, there's one, um, there's, there's one of a little um, penguin, a little dancing penguin. That's my favorite. I just... <laughs> I don't know the penguin. I mean, oh, you should. You should, yeah. Um, well, we came, so p the poem that you read, a piece of um, so lovely, so beautiful to hear you read it about Beverly Buchanan, we found it on your blog. Oh, and, you know, we came across it and were so taken by it and wanted to include it in the exhibition. Um, but we would love to hear a little bit about your relationship to Beverly and to her artwork. Well, the other Beverly is here in the audience, my friend from many years ago at Spelman. And she introduced me to Beverly Buchanan, and I went, I don't know if we went together to see, we went together to see Beverly, and I was so taken with her work because um, you don't have any of, of, of what I'm thinking about in the exhibit, but she did something so magical with shacks. You know, so many of us in the South grew up in shacks. We, we lived in shacks. And so it was the, the responsibility of our, our mothers, usually, to make them homes. And as many of you know, if you've read any of my work about my mother, my mother made our shacks really beautiful uh, because she was an artist and she was just, you know. Um, so Beverly, uh, in Athens, Georgia, I went in to see her work. And there she had created these shacks in these vivid, beautiful colors. Uh, that, and they were just dancing. They were just, um, if you have ever seen pictures of the, the shacks, you know, from long ago that people had, and they were gray, you know, they leaked, uh, they often didn't have a porch, you know, you just have to use a stump or something to get into them. Um, they were they're really pretty bad, and yet what she managed to capture was the way that the, some of the inhabitants, like my mother, for instance, uh, out of her own spirit, somehow turned those desolate places into dancing uh, shacks full of life. <clears throat> and I think what I, I really liked was that she shared something about how you can um, remember your childhood's happiness uh, through art uh, in this way. You know, you just create the garden, you create the shack, you create the quilt. In fact, in this exhibit, I was expecting a quilt by Faith Ringgold to be hanging somewhere because she was such a master uh, of that form and it has such deep roots in our, uh, in our world, you know, in the African-American world because for so long, that was the way we told our story. In fact, when I was writing um, the screenplay for The Color Purple, um, I decided that uh, it was boring to me 
to write the thing just as I'd already written it. So I decided to make the letters into a story quilt, but it didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a part of our tradition, you know, to, to write the story um, in quilting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, when we were talking about this exhibition and we were talking about um, what to call it, I walked into the office of our then Vice Director of Education, Radia Harper, who's here tonight, and we were talking about this show and these artists and wanting to have an impact on the art world, and Radia put her hand very firmly on her desk and said, we didn't want to change the art world, we wanted a revolution. Mm -hmm. And that's where this exhibition title comes from. And I'm just wondering, having heard you speak tonight about meditation and, and that sort of practice, how do you feel, um, do you feel differently about what revolution meant in, to you in the period that you started off talking about, all those assassinations, that moment, and then where we are today? Uh, yeah, revolution meant uh, tenderness toward the self and love of the self uh, and love of the people in your community and the devotion to, to each other's freedom. Uh, and we have not arrived. Uh, except, you know, some of us have and some of us do because we just keep up the struggle. I mean, we understand that to, to be fully liberated uh, is a full-time job. You, you have to really fight hard against um, the oppression in this culture, which actually works overtime to make us feel like we are odd, that we are, we're not quite the right. In fact, I, I spend a lot of my time outside the country, and when I come back, I was trying to explain this to someone. It was as if all the people were in, in the US were just watching themselves on TV, you know? And in a way, that's true. You know, it's, it, there's a, there's a mesmerizing quality to television, and it captures people. Uh, but what it also does is it makes people of color feel like they're a minority in the world. And this is very dangerous. You know, pretty soon, pretty soon you won't remember, you won't remember that you're in the majority, you know, because you're just programmed to believe that you're that one dark face in a sea of pale faces, you know? And, and you have to really, really pay attention, you know, to save yourself from that. And also what I noticed coming back is how many of our children have forgotten what they look like. You know, they, they start really early redoing the, themselves to, to fit TV. Uh, and, and this is uh, extremely cruel. It's, it's cruel to them that, that they are being forced to be this way. Uh, though you understand how it happens. It's, it's not mysterious. You know, they, they want the same hair, they want the same color, they want the same nose. It reminds me of uh, being in South Korea uh, many years ago. And the people there under, under American colonization are so brainwashed that at the time they all wanted round eyes. So the, it was coming up to a graduation day and, and the whole, um, class of people who were graduating, they were all really brilliant and made great grades and did all kinds of stuff. They were all being taken en masse, you know, to have their eyes made round. Now really. I mean, do we need more round eyes? <laughs> it, it, it's just, it, you know, it, it, what, is, what is happening through this, this, this um, disconnect uh, of, of what is real in the world uh, and what is, you know, what is fake uh, is, is really hard. It's, it's, it's doing us in. You've been very patient. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should start with some yes. questions from the audience. And again, please, if you have a question, go to one of the microphones on either side of the room so that you can be part of the live stream. Thanks so much, and um, thank you so much, Ms. Walker, for being here and joining us and sharing your light with all of us. Um, I, just to dovetail on the last question that you were saying um, about my history as a broadcast journalist, it is so true that one has to fit in the box of the television mm -hmm. and cannot have the hair the way that it normally would be. And mm -hmm. so I, I, I very much um, understand that. <clears throat> in any case, I'm also a poet and a, getting a meditation teacher certification with Jack Kornfield and Tara Brock. And what the initial opening, <clears throat> which you just dovetailed back to, about the business of getting to know the mind, 
calming the mind, understanding the mind, why we're here, how we work, how we're connected at a more experiential level, I often find that people usually try to go to meditation for two things. One, to kind of be calm, and the other thing is to kind of um, sort of find a way to do what you're doing at a deeper level, to connect with everyone. But because of what you're talking about, that masquerading of ego and personality and conditioning as the true self, meaning the deeper connected part, people don't then sit. They don't actually find their way to the cushion through the self-hatred and through the conditioning. So I'm wondering if um, you have any recommendations for there's a way to get people to be able to sit and not see it as a luxury when they feel like they should be out in the streets and, and, and doing stuff, and also not use it as a way to be sort of spiritual bypassing, as a way to just sort of retreat. So a more p perhaps practical um, you know, suggestion, if you have any, for that. I'm not sure I understand your question. Just... So if you're sitting on a cushion and you hate yourself and you're filled with conditioning and you think that your ego self is who you really are based on all the things that you've been talking about. You're not about, sitting long enough. Is that what, okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's why there's that phrase, more sitting required. Mm -hmm. You know, you just sit and sit and sit and sit uh, until you, you settle out. You know, you just kind of... Uh, a lot of that stuff will actually just start to drain away because it's not you. Mm -hmm. You know, it is conditioning. It's just stuff that's thrown on top of the clear sky that you actually have in there somewhere, you know? Um, and it does take discipline, but uh, I think in my own case, I did it because I, I needed to. You know, I reached a point where uh, I didn't see any other way of actually saving um, the, the clear sky that, that I, I have, you know, that I deserve as a human being, uh, which means that I can actually encounter other people without harming them. You know, how about having a mind that is so clear that you don't have to harm people, no matter what you think about them? Mm -hmm. I mean, really. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, that's what I would say, you know, just, just keep at it. You know, it, it's, it's uh, if you can go to Pilates, if you can go to yoga, if you can, you know, ride your bicycle for 10 miles, you can sit for another two hours. You know, Milarepa sat for, you know, years, really. He did. Because I don't know if you know the story about Milarepa, but he, he was a guy who uh, was mistreated when his father died and his mother, he and his mother were really badly treated by the village. And she was so angry, the mother, that she gave him uh, enough money that she, I don't know, forgot how she got it. But she sent him off to be trained by a sorcerer. And he became this powerful sorcerer. And he came back and he put a spell on the whole village that had abused them and killed all of them. Uh, and so, he then, you know, went on his way, but, but, you know, you can't actually do that and continue to feel that great about yourself, you know, which is, which is interesting because you think about how many bombings that, you know, people do and how they're going to actually have to feel about. But anyway, so he um, wanted to clear his, his soul, and that is why he, he just sat. He sat in a cave for years, you know, and, and the plants just grew all over him. Uh, and he became someone with time that the Buddhists, all, all Buddhists, really revere because of his dedication to transforming this evil act uh, into something that he could, you know, overcome and then use his abilities for the good of, of people. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, let's go over here. <laughs> Thank you for being here. That's wonderful in and of itself. And I'm glad that you brought up um, quilts because I recently read your everyday use. I loved it. Um, oh, and by the way, the Faith Ringgold, you mentioned her quilts. We don't have a quilt, but I thought the, the piece for the woman's house was very quilt-like. So maybe you'll take a look at that and enjoy it. I'm wondering if there's a story behind your story, um, everyday use. Of course. I'd love to hear it. Oh dear! <laughs> <laughs> I, you are. Oh God! I'm sorry. I, there's something yeah. really sacred about um, 
what we put into something like a quilt that it, it's hours and hours and heart and blood and, and it hurts, it's painful, and then to use it, I think is is beautiful and sacred, and I that's why it moved me. So I would like to yeah. hear the story. But I, I think what I was tr I was wanting to share though with people uh, is how um, we can be trapped by art and think of it as something that is just a decoration when the function of art is healing and covering us and, and protecting us. And so one sister wants the quilt to hang on the wall. The other sister, who is the more downtrodden sister, wants the quilt because it, you know it's all her memories. You know, There's her dress, there's somebody else's pants. You know, there's a, a whole history in it and she wants to use it because she loves it. She loved the people who wore the clothes that the quilt was made out of. You know, uh, so it it really um, you know I I have mixed feelings about museums. <laughs> I do, I do. In fact, when I was in the Louvre and also at the British Museum, uh, in the British Museum I was I was very close to throwing a fit, uh, and in the Louvre I was very close to jumping out of the window uh, because you just see all the stuff they've ripped off. And they've done it in every country. Uh, and so, and then the, and the way that in the British Museum, I felt they had deliberately twisted the, the identity of the Egyptians. And they did it in a very clever way. Uh, they had all these, you know, statues and all the stuff that you see from Egypt, and a lot of the bald headed people. But what they did was they had found, you know, a wig that I'm sure they bought just right outside the door there. <laughs> but a very straight wig, so that, and they, they put that there, so you would just assume that the people that you're looking at all had hair like that. And they didn't, you know? I mean, you can look at some of the, the drawings and you can see that they didn't. Uh, so, so this kind of use of, of uh, the museum as a way to further oppress people, you know, and mislead them. You know, I, I have a hard time with, with that. And then in the Louvre, I mean, honestly, they, those people have looted it just so many countries and so many people of their essential material that they need for their own health. You know, you need your art. You need it. I mean, you need it daily. That's, and that's why it's called everyday use. You know, that, that this quilt uh, will be something that heals this young woman, you know, as she's lying under it, you know? And it's not just hanging somewhere where she'll never see it again. I mean, we have to really rethink museums, I think. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the director. <laughs> we're, gonna get, we're gonna do that, though, because you're not wrong. You're not wrong. Um, can we have our next question? Hi. How's it going? Um, my name is Delasia. I'm an organizer, also the kid with the snap, so thank you for the shout out. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I have a question about um, working class women of color and advice for empowering and illuminating the natural womanism that exists in working class communities. If you have any thoughts on how we can kind of change the paradigm around female empowerment in working class communities of color, because we're powerful and we exist in our communities as powerful women, but often because of media as well as a myriad of other things, um, it's not always internalized. So, It's not what? Always internalized, internalized. the power that we hold. Well, you know, I, I really am of the opinion that people can really free themselves if they want to be free and that they can do all kinds of things, but they can't do it alone. And, and that collectivity and, and, and circling is really the, the way of the future, if there is one. So, you know, when you have a, a query like that, uh, the way to deal with it, in, in my view, is that you get on the phone or the whatever and connect with like 11 or 12 other women that you, you know, you like and you admire and you think can think with you on this. Uh, and and, you, and you, you go to the mat with it, you know, and, and then you just keep, uh, expanding that circle with this query uh, and at some point you will begin to come up with what you need yourself 
I, I think we are really in danger of, of uh, losing a sense of possibility in, 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 um, in community. I mean, they, look at what happened when, when all the women and men and children got together to, for the marches. You know, there you have that, that flash of what actually people can have more of in their lives on a daily basis if they can move themselves to, to make it, you know, to, to, to in, insist on having circles, communities of people uh, who, who get together to work on specific areas like this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. I graduated from Spelman and Yay. went back for my 25th reunion last weekend. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, you know, I always thought I was being raised to be a revolutionary um, against racism and sexism, and then um, was raising my own children that way, both boys and girls. And my third child, who's now nine, is transgender. And, uh, and so I think I, immediately I thought I was, had failed to, at the time the child was three, and said, Mom, I'm not a girl. And I thought I had failed to raise a feminist. Like maybe I had forgotten to talk about um, Sojourner Truth. <laughs> to my three-year-old or you know I, th I thought maybe this kid was rejecting being a weak girl and so it took me a long time to understand that once again this was just about uh, owning yourself and determining who you are and then letting the world sort of deal with it as confusing as that is so I'm just curious to know how you think about this current sort of gender revolution that we are seeing all over magazines and on television I mean I see it in my house and in my friends' houses. Um, but yeah, just curious to know how the, the, the revolution is translated in gender, which I thought always for a long time was very static. I didn't think it was something that we could determine. I thought it was already predetermined. I think it's amazing. Mm. I, I do. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it just proves that the whole thing is never ending. After this, there'll be something else. You know, so the best thing to do is just roll with it. <laughs> you know, I mean, help our children to, to be whoever they are. And I have no problem with any of it because I think a woman's body, you know, is where we all come from, really. And that being the case, you know, it could be, you could be anything, really, you know? Um, so, um, it just keeps going. Thank you. Roll with it. <laughs> Thank you. And you can tell I don't have a whole lot of experience, but I'm learning. I didn't. Want, yeah, I just wanted the um, the initial sort of the gut reaction to it. Not that you were studying it or anything, but how you rolled with it, felt it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I guess I feel too that uh, all of these. Um, things that seem so odd to us uh, are our teachers and that we are to learn, you know, to be more uh, inclusive. We are to learn to have bigger spirits. We are to learn a lot uh, from the things that, you know, we, we have no way of even imagining them years ago, you know? Um, and I think that's how I accept it. I accept whatever happens. And sometimes what happens is very painful and, and very challenging. But I do accept what happens as a, as a teacher that I'm gonna learn something from. We have about five minutes more. I'm just warning you in advance of the time when you're not all gonna get to ask your questions. <laughs> but please, go ahead. Hi, Ms. Locker, thank you for being here. I have a general question about how to engage in the revolution. I am a recent college graduate, so I was very involved in... <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, a recent what? Oh, a recent college graduate, so I was very involved in the Black Lives Matter movement on my campus. And one of the things that often comes up in conversations with my friends is the idea that we need to have self-care and make sure that we're taking care of ourselves 
while we're also involved in these revolutionary acts, whether or not we're going to protest or we are writing letters to representatives, but there's also this idea that you kind of get lost in it, right? Like these things are happening and you're hurting and you're struggling and mm -hmm. you're trying to figure out like where your place is going to be. So I think I have two questions for you. How do you kind of balance self-care while being in the revolution, but also how do you find what your specific place or what your specific act is going to be in that revolution as well? How do I determine what my specific act is going to be? Lots of sitting. <laughs> um, because I don't want it to be wasted. You know, I don't want to go off into a direction that is not fulfilling for me on some level. And I want to keep growing. And I also want to make uh, alliances with people that I respect. It's really important to, uh, to be allied with people who, you know, have character, you know, and who, who have depth and who are not just chattering, uh, which is so likely, it seems, in, in some, quote, revolutionary circles where people just talk, you know? Uh, but if you say to them, well, go out there and, and help this farmer who's been thrown off his land, um, they, they won't know how to get there, they won't know anything about farming, or they won't want to study it, you know, because it just doesn't, it doesn't make sense to them. It's not, it doesn't have a strut in it, you know? Uh, revolution is work. You know, revolution is work. It's like love. Love is work. Um, so what was the other part of your question? How do you balance self-care while engaging in acts of revolution? Well, I think, I think it's important. I haven't had enough of it, although my friends think that I just have all these hammocks that they see. <laughs> <laughs> I do, I love hammocks. So, so wherever I live, even in my living room, I have a hammock. Um, but I'm, you know, I don't get in there as much as I should, but it reminds me uh, that I have a right to lie in the hammock after I've done, you know, all of the stuff that I've been doing. Uh, and I guess what I would say is just love yourself. You know, love yourself, respect yourself, um, and be, you know, just be secure in knowing that you were created out of wonder. I mean, you, you, you know, you're precious. And therefore, it is totally right for you to, you know, have self-care. There's nothing ever wrong with taking care of yourself. You know, and then you go out, and out of fullness, you, you offer what you have to the people and to the community and to the world, not out of poverty. Thank you. Mm -hmm. can you, this can be our last question. Yes, you. Yes, OK. Um, I have a question about the color purple. You know, I went to the movie, read the book, and I made sure it was in the library. I'm a retired librarian. But my question is, in watching the movie and reading the book of color purple, and you see what's happening in, our li in the lives of our young black community within, with the police and, and Black Lives Matter, do you see that theme coming back again that you could rewrite the color purple. Well, uh, how would you rewrite it? <laughs> I mean, because of what's happening in our communities today. Right. The, the violence between the black community and the police, the, our young boys, and the things that are going on. Because when, you, when we watch that movie, you see all that, you know, when, the violence that's going on. You see what I'm trying to Well, I, I think what I, what I see and what I will offer, although it may not be useful, right. I would contend that the violence was happening then right. as well. As now. That's uh, exactly what I'm saying. And how can you bring it up, rewrite, well, not rewrite the color purple, but maybe add, do a new addition to it? <laughs> uh, well, ho hold on a second. Volume two. No, 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 no. I, I wrote, uh, I think, let's see, four other novels after that. Right. Uh, and so they, they're not going in the direction of police violence exactly, but, but other kinds of violence. But I mean, the racism that's being brought out today, it's being brought out more today. I don't know if because of what's going on 
It's being more open. You know what I'm saying? I, I do. Yes, yes. Right. It, it, and, and it is with, more open. With what's going on with our uh -huh. president and, and the, the, the thoughts. You know how it's bringing out Well, that? you know, I, I write on my blog. In fact, one of the pieces that I wrote when Trump was elected was, it's called Don't Despair. You know, uh, so so it's, you know, I'm not the kind of writer who is interested really in writing sequels. Uh, I just I just don't like that. But um, I, I am responsive to what is going on, uh, and I do write about it, and it's there, and it's free. I mean, that's the <laughs> that's the part that I really like. I mean, you don't have to pay a cent. To, to read, you know, years of stuff. I started a blog when Ob when Obama was elected the first time. Right. So since uh, 2008, I have been publishing, um, and and you have you don't have to pay anything. I mean, it's just right there. You just do you have a computer? Yes, I do. Okay, well then we're in connection. You just <laughs> open it up, and turn to my you know page, and th you there it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. We actually, we have time for one more question, actually. So, thank you. Hi. Um, thank, again, as everyone said, thank you for being here. Um, I'm Isabella. I'm part of the Museum Apprentice Program. It's a team program here at the museum. Um, <laughs> shout out. Um, and I'm lucky enough to be in an um, African-American literature literature class at my high school I'm a senior um, and we were doing presentations all week and today um, one of our groups was teaching about um, sort of the skin bleaching industry um, and you were brought up as someone who sort of coined the term colorism um, and sort of just about that I was wondering do you think that part of like the solution or part of deconstructing colorism within oneself or your own community um, is what you said, like moving past what someone calls you or labels you as, even if it's your own community or group of people. For some reason, I, I have a hard time. Sorry. Yeah. Could, did you understand this? Yeah, sure. I understand the question either. Could you repeat I'm, the question, yeah, please? Yeah, sure. Sorry. Um, I guess, do you think that part of moving past colorism within oneself um, is moving past what someone calls you, even if it's occurring within your own community. That makes sense. Well, I think the answer to that probably is just self-acceptance, you know, really, that mm -hmm. you um, develop the capacity to tune out what other people call you uh, and to realize that you are divine. I mean, you know, if you... If you just think about what a wonder it is that you exist, you know, of whatever color, I mean, what a miracle. Can you imagine how silly it is for people to be talking about, oh, you know, what color you are, what shade of color you are, what your hair is like and all that, when they should be saying, my God, you're here. <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> really? So, so I, I kind of hear what you're saying. I'm not mm -hmm. hearing it as yeah. well as I would like to, but I'm just saying go to a deeper level mm -hmm. of self-acceptance yeah. and, and love of self and really, you know, just exhilaration mm -hmm. at what you are, you know, right. that you got here, you know, in all your hairiness and all <laughs> your, you know, pickiness and all your whatever. You know, it's, it's, if people could just see themselves as the wonder that they are, mm -hmm. You know, and, and they could if we weren't programmed so severely, you know, into judging every little thing about each other. Right. I mean, we're, we're incredible beings. I mean, just that your fingers move and you don't tell them. <laughs> yeah, that's true, it's amazing. Um, just, sorry, one more thing. Part of, I feel like my issue, not, I guess, with that is sort of leaving someone else behind that is thinking those things about you because they must think them about themselves. So when you move past something within yourself, like, is it m just as important to weigh that you're leaving someone else behind thinking the same thing? Because colorism is very internalized. And someone that's telling you something or is being colorist toward you probably thinks the same thing about themselves. 
Gosh, I really wish I could look up and hear you. <laughs> but what comes to mind, and this probably has nothing to do with what you just said, because I can't <laughs> claim that I really understood what you said. <clears throat> but there is a, you know the Dhammapada? It's, mm -hmm. a, it's an Indian, uh, old, old scripture that's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, but it says something like, um, it is better to go on the path alone than to travel with a fool. <laughs> so, 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 if I'm hearing you even close, um, sometimes, you know, we are with immature people or people who just need a little more time to reach where you have already gotten. Uh, and, I, and then I think with tenderness and a bow, you go on your way. Really. It's, it's hard to do, but... Uh, don't be stuck by somebody else's, um, you know, smallness. You know, people do develop at different rates, and, and that person or persons, they, you know, they may or may not develop to where you are, but you can't just wait around. You have to keep moving. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Walker. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, as you leave, I'll just mention that, um, this, that every Thursday in June, we'll be screening films by young, black, queer, female-identified, and non-gender-conforming artists and filmmakers working in Brooklyn. Um, working today as part of our What We Believe Black Queer Brooklyn on Film series. You can find out more about it um, on our website. Also, thank you. Also, our June 1st Saturday Queer Continuums is devoted to We Wanted a Revolution and Pride Month. And our July 1st Saturday is also devoted to the exhibition along with July 4th. We'd love to see you all for the music, performance, tours of where we wanted, of we wanted a revolution and more. Thank you.